Uh, I'm Alex Zambelli. Uh, I'm a senior product manager at Hulu. Uh, I focus on the playback pipeline at Hulu. And uh, in my previous job, I worked at uh, Ice Cream Planet, uh, worked in the Live Encoder product there. And one of the things I uh, got really familiar with when I was working on Live Encoder was uh, Skype 35, which if you've done any work with Live Linear, you probably have at least heard of Skype 35. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why we use it in OTT because it is a weird sort of obscure broadcast standard that we kind of brought over uh, into the OTT world. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about also how we apply it in uh, OTT scenarios. Uh, so first of all, what is SCUDI? Or some people will say SCTE. Cool people will say SCUDI. Uh, so Society of Cable Telecommunications Engineers, uh, kind of an old, like, telco, cable, broadcast uh, uh, industry organization, they do a whole bunch of standards that have nothing to do with digital video, actually. They do even, I found this out today, equipment and cabling standards. So they have a vast array of topics that they cover. Uh, so one of my pet peeves is when people talk about Sky 35 in the context of, you know, like, ad markers, some of that, and they go, SCUDI markers. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, you're saying MPEG markers. I don't know what that means. Like, SCUDI 35 is a very specific standard. SCUDI is just a big organization that does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so what is SCUDI 35? So there's an official name for it, and I hate it, because it doesn't tell you anything about what it does. <laughs> if I had the power to rename it, I would probably call it in-band event signaling for live video, because that's basically what it is. Um, it, actually uh, addresses a whole bunch of different uh, use cases that, and the one you probably have heard of is ad insertion, so that's usually how it comes up. And there's a reason for that, and I'll talk about why it tends to come up in the context of ad insertion. But there's a bunch of other use cases that it also addresses, like alternate content replacement. Uh, EPG synchronization this is actually a big one that's now becoming more and more relevant. So when you're streaming something, how do you actually match that to an EPG? How do you know what is the program that you're playing? How do you know, you know if you're in an ad break or you're not in an ad break? That kind of stuff. Uh, content identification. So, uh, so that's my other sort of pet peeve about a Sky 35 is that people will say, oh, it's the ad marker thing. It's not just ad markers. It's really any kind of uh, event timelines or timeline events that you want to essentially communicate in band in, in the video stream itself. Um, if you have not read Sky 35 and you're thinking about kind of digging into that spec, I recommend actually reading Sky 67 first. Uh, it's the recommended uh, practices for Sky 35. It's much better at explaining use cases before it actually kind of dives into the standard itself. If you read Sky 35, it kind of assumes that you know why it exists and what the use cases are, and it can be really kind of challenging to read it and understand it. So I recommend 67 first. Um, so the reason why it tends to come up in the context of ad insertion is because that was its original use case. So even before digital cable, digital TV, even back in the analog days, uh, we've always had basically an ad-supported, uh, ad-sponsored uh, programming TV uh, model in the U.S. Um, so the way it works is that typically like network broadcasters, they sell national ad time, but the local affiliates that are affiliated with those networks, they sell the local ad time. And typically what they get allocated is about two minutes of local ad time per hour of, uh, of programming. And so if you're ever watching your local station, so here in Seattle, if you're watching like King 5 or something, and you see a Coca-Cola ad, that's probably a national ad. But if you see like the local like, you know, mattress store, firm, whatever ad, that's probably a local Seattle ad that's being broadcast or inserted, I should say, by the local affiliate. Um, so that was the, the original uh, use case. Sky 35 has expanded like way beyond that. So, because um, th what they realized eventually, especially in the context of digital, is that once you're dealing with sparse metadata that you're sending down the stream, you can you know, do a lot more than just signal what the, you know, when to insert an ad. You can also signal what's currently playing. You can signal uh, all sorts of different you know, segments of your timeline that you're basically uh, streaming. So, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention some of the traditional TV programming distribution models. So typically, right, like we started out by having uh, broadcast networks, which would send their signals to a local affiliate station. And that affiliate station would, you know, broadcast over the air, pick it up uh, over the antenna. That's how we did distribution in the early days. 
then transition to cable. Uh, with the local affiliates, more or less the same workflow, except the signal goes to a cable head end instead of over the air. Uh, but then there's also national cable networks that basically go straight from uh, their, uh, um, uh, their location to uh, the cable head end. So the reason I mention all this is because this is why Sky 35 and the whole concept of ad insertion first came up is because the broadcast networks needed a way to basically signal to the local affiliates or to the cable head end that, hey, there's a local uh, opportunity, there's an opportunity for a local ad coming up. You should probably get ready to insert that ad into the stream. So it all basically comes back to how do you signal events in a linear feed? Um, the Sky 35 message formats, uh, so they come in actually two flavors. Uh, the, the more popular one is the original format, which is a binary format. Uh, it is a very sparse, very condensed uh, message. Typical size of Sky 35 messages are about 30 to 50 bytes. So it's a kind of a pain in the ass to, uh, to read through uh, like Dash or HLS manifests where you see like these either hex or, or base 64 encoded strings. Because you have to basically go then like run them through the coder to figure out what it means. So it's a pain, but it is very, uh, very compressed. Uh, several years ago, I think it was like 2014, I think, uh, uh, Scotty finally added an XML representation of essentially the same syntax uh, into the spec. I'm yet to see actually anybody use it. It really doesn't get a whole lot of mileage. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I feel like generally, like when we're working in the OTT space, right, we come from software backgrounds. XML, JSON are a lot friendlier, a lot easier to read, uh, but yeah, for some reason just has not become popular. So typically when you see Sky 35 message messages, you see them as base 64 or hex encoded strings of a binary payload. And that's basically what it looks like. So uh, you'll often see this in a HLS manifest or a dash manifest that's carrying Sky 35 messages. You basically need to run it through a decoder to actually figure out what the all the what all the parameters mean. Uh, I've now worked with the same <laughs> developer at two different companies who has now written two Scuddy 35 decoder utilities completely separately uh, because uh, for some reason there's not a whole lot of uh, Sky 35 related tools online. Uh, so Sky 35. Um, I'm going to jump right into basically the syntax of it. So uh, there's uh, two important parts to it. There's the command type that uh, dictates basically what kind of Sky 35 message it is. And then there are descriptor objects, which essentially just attach additional metadata to those commands. Uh, in the early days, the only command that existed was the splice insert command, and there were no descriptor objects. So very first version of the Sky 35 spec, it was just splice insert, and it basically said, you have something coming up at this timestamp, and maybe I'll give you a duration, maybe I won't. Uh, and the implication was that it was just signaling that there's a local avail coming up. Uh, as the use cases expanded, they realized that, okay, that doesn't quite cut it, but they didn't want to break backwards compatibility with existing systems. So they said, well, how about if we introduced uh, something called a time signal command, which basically just says a timestamp, but then we're going to attach some descriptor object to it that's going to tell us actually what that event means. Uh, so typically when you see time signal commands, they come with the uh, segmentation descriptor objects. And those segmentation descriptor objects, objects are the ones that tell you what kind of event it is, what it, what it is actually trying to tell you. Uh, so when we talk about segmentation in the context of live linear, uh, we're talking about how we segment the timeline. We're not talking about, so if you're familiar with dash and HLS, we're not talking about HLS segments, dash segments. We're not, we're not talking about media segments or files. We're talking about a concept of a timeline where a program, for example, is a segment of a timeline. A chapter is a uh, even smaller segment of that timeline. Uh, uh, an advertisement or a placement opportunity, a yet smaller segment of that timeline. So in the context of Sky 35, when you hear segments, they're referring to timeline segments. Um, there's really two types of uh, Sky 35 uh, segmentation descriptors that you get. Uh, 
There are some that indicate singular events, so they're basically one-off events. They say something's going to happen at this time, and that's it. Don't worry about it afterwards. And then you get the other kind, which are segment boundaries. So typically, so what, what they are is basically they, they are for, for any kind of segment that's bounded, you'll see two types of messaging, uh, messages, one that's indicating the start and another one that's indicating the end of that segment. Uh, so when you look at basically the segmentation uh, 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 types uh, and their IDs in the Sky 35 spec, you'll see that there'll be a program start and a program end. There'll be an advertisement start and an advertisement end. Um, and so um, the other thing to know about the segmentation descriptors is that they will typically carry also something called a UPID. And the UPID is a unique program ID, which is another misnomer because the original usage of it was just to indicate what program is playing. That's been expanded as well. Now it's basically just a sort of a general asset ID. Uh, and uh, it supports a whole bunch of different types. Uh, so if you're familiar with like uh, either or TMS ID, those are all in the spec. So if you basically are trying to communicate that the program that's playing right now is you know, uh, this TMS ID uh, program, uh, you can use that. You can also identify the advertisements themselves. So if you're inserting a specific ad where it's national or local, you can actually indicate uh, you can identify the ad as well. Uh, so the UPID uh, usage has expanded quite a bit. So uh, since we are talking about different segments of the timeline, it's also important to understand that there's a hierarchy of those segments. So this is the kind of the general topology. So you can think of network as being the highest level of your timeline. In most cases, if you're dealing with live linear, the network is going to be just one network, right? Like if you're you know, watching CNN, it's always CNN. Um, there are some networks that actually will switch between two different networks or multiple networks within the same live linear feed. Uh, cartoon uh, network and Adult Swim is the typical example. Uh, in fact, Cynics will say that the only reason why the network segment exists is because of Turner just put it in the spec because they needed it for that one use case. <laughs> so uh, Adult Swim, half the day, it's Adult Swim, half the day the channel carries uh, Cartoon Network, so they have to identify which network is on at any given time. So the next uh, unit below network would be a program. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can then divide each program into chapters. You don't have to. It's optional. I mean, all of these are optional, right? Uh, but some networks do it, some networks don't. Uh, and then another way you can look at a program is that you can also look at different ways that you can break up a program for advertisement purposes, uh, placement opportunities. So uh, what is the difference between a placement opportunity and an advertisement? Uh, placement opportunity is just the slot. It's just the time slot that says you got 90 seconds to insert something here. Um, the advertisement is the actual... Uh, asset, the ad asset that goes in there, right? So what you'll see often is that, for example, there'll be a, a provider advertisement uh, for that Coca-Cola ad that's a national ad because they don't expect anybody downstream of them to replace that ad. They're basically just saying, there's an ad coming up, but we don't want you to do anything with it, but we're still going to tell you what it is. Um, and then you'll see a, pro, uh, a distributor placement opportunity, which is essentially telling the distributor whether that's the local affiliate or whether that's uh, Comcast or Hulu, uh, that there's an opportunity now to go replace whatever ad is coming up. Um, and uh, and it's, one of the things that's kind of interesting and also challenging about uh, this topology, particularly when it comes to placement opportunities and ads, is they can, they can be overlapped and they can contain each other. So what you see often is, for example, there'll be uh, a large uh, provider placement opportunity that's, let's say, three minutes long. And then within it, like maybe in the middle or maybe towards the end, there'll be a distributor placement opportunity within it. So it makes handling those types of events much more difficult when you're under receiving end of it because you sort of have to end up build, building a state machine to kind of keep track of like, okay, what's active now? Uh, you, you can't just, you know, forget about history. And that's especially true in the context of HLS and Dash, where we have linear manifests, right? Because they have a concept of history. They're not just, you know, bits coming in and you throw them away. You basically need to be able to re-download the manifest and know exactly what happened, not just in the last segment, but, uh, you know, 30 seconds ago or three minutes ago. So speaking of HLS, um, HLS is probably the, the format that's been dealing with Sky 35 the longest. Um, 
And uh, there's basically two uh, standard ways of signaling SCI-35 and HLS. One is actually prescribed by SCUDI itself. It's in the SCI-35 spec. Uh, so they basically prescribe using X, X SCI-35 tags to, uh, to signal SCI-35s. Um, there's only one required attribute, and that's Q. And the value of Q is a base64 encoded uh, string representing the binary payload of the SCI-35 message. Um, there's optional attributes, and the only purpose there is just to make the manifest more readable, and also if you're uh, building a player or some other system that's you know relying on reading that manifest, that perhaps it doesn't have to actually parse the binary payload of every message uh, at that point. Um, Apple introduced uh, something, uh, an alternative way of uh, signaling any kind of uh, uh, events and ranges in a timeline, uh, as Apple tends to do. Um, so that, uh, the generic method for signaling basically date ranges within a, a timeline uh, is XTX date range. And they actually did go a step further and specify how to uh, also carry SCI 35 messages using that tag. Um, they use uh, hex encoded strings instead of uh, base64, so there's that little difference as well. Uh, which one to use? They, they both carry the same payload, so ultimately like, they both uh, um, have the same function and fulfill it. Uh, two slight differences, uh, the Sky35 tag uh, relies on the position in the playlist to essentially tell you when the event is. Uh, the idea is that you see the tag and then whatever the next segment is, then that's basically the first frame of that segment uh, that's trying to signal to you. Um, Apple day range uh, relies on UTC times, uh, which means that it lacks a little bit of uh, uh, frame accuracy when it comes to uh, things like ad insertion, for example. Um, it does have one advantage, though, and that's that like the native AV player APIs uh, does support uh, day range tags. It has no awareness of SCART 35 itself, so it won't actually try to like decode the payloads, but uh, if you're building an app uh, for iOS or tvOS, you can basically at least, you know, you have an API where you can query what these events in the timeline are um, and uh, what the day ranges are. And then you still have to go, of course, and decode the payloads, but it makes the job slightly easier. Um, so here's an example of a playlist. Uh, Josh, I think you're going to recognize this one because uh, I believe this is <laughs> an Ice Cream Planet one. Uh, so hopefully that's uh, legible enough. But um, so what you see, for example, is uh, uh, the top of this playlist, uh, there is a day range tag there. Uh, and uh, it's got a sky 35 out attribute with a hex string. Uh, what this is actually saying is uh, it's basically saying that, um, and you notice, by the way, that the program date time, which indicates the start of the playlist, is uh, 5, 13 PM. But the start date of this day range here is uh, 5, 00. So it's in the past. So what it's trying to say is that there is actually something still in progress, even though it's outside of the playlist. Uh, if you went and decoded that Sky35 message, you would find that that's a program start uh, message. So it's basically saying there's a program in progress, and uh, that's basically how it's indicating that. So at some point later in this playlist, there's another day range uh, tag, and it's giving a start time that's now in the future this time. Um, probably referring to this very next segment. Uh, it's given a plan duration attribute, so it's saying we think this segment that's coming up is going to be 196 seconds long. And if you want to decode that uh, other hex string uh, in that tag, you find that that's probably a, I think it's a provider advertisement start. Um, and this playlist example actually has both the, the Apple way of doing things and also the SCUDI uh, tag as well. So you can use either one. They're basically both telling you the same thing. Just one is hex, one is base64. Um, and typically when you have something like a program, uh, sorry, a uh, advertisement start, eventually there'll be advertisement end. And I believe that one actually comes in down here. So this is actually a really good example of uh, the nested uh, advertisement and placement opportunities that we were talking about earlier. So uh, basically you have a provider advertisement segment that's about 196 seconds long. And somewhere in the middle of it, they decided to allow for a, I think, a 60-second uh, placement opportunity for the local uh, distributor. Um, so that's a great example of nested uh, advertisements and placement opportunities. 
And it can be challenging to deal with those because if you're just assuming that basically, you know, you're, you're going to be told what the next thing is that you need to process, this is problematic, right? Because you still need to keep track of when to close out uh, certain segments. The other thing that's problematic is that if you miss messages, like so for whatever reason, if the upstream encoder never received that uh, end message and you have a state machine, now you could be under the impression that your advertisement is still going and going and going. And if you're basically trying to lock player controls or do something like, well, add insertion, that's problematic, right? Um, in Dash, uh, Sky67 suggests two ways also of uh, uh, signaling Sky35 in Dash. Uh, so one is to put in the manifest, kind of like uh, with uh, HLS. Um, and, uh, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, the first method they recommend actually says, if you can, try to align those Sky35 segments to periods in Dash which is a really nice idea, but it kind of assumes that you have like really clean transitions between those Sky 35 segments so that your program goes into an ad and your ad goes into a placement opportunity, right? So it kind of doesn't really take into account overlap and nested segments and things like that. Um, a more complex way, but probably also a more powerful way of doing it is to use uh, the event stream uh, in Dash. So either basically uh, signal events in the, uh, in the manifest or signal events in the media segments themselves. Um, and uh, you can use either XML or binary to express the Sky35 messages. Um, and you can see this example over here. So uh, that would be an example of the XML representation of a Sky35 event in an event stream in the manifest itself. And this would be the, the uh, binary representation, but it would be in the e-message box in the uh, actual FMP4 uh, fragment. All right, so I think we're probably at 30 minutes or so. Uh, so at this point, I can open up for questions, uh, or I can talk more about some other challenges. I don't know. <laughs> There's always challenges with Sky35. It is not easy to deal with. Uh, I will say probably the... Uh, the biggest challenge that I run into is the fact that not all the networks agree on how to use it. So they all use it slightly differently. Uh, they don't use the full set necessarily. They don't even signal the same things in the same way necessarily. Uh, you'll go to one network and they will signal their, you know, pro, uh, like their national ads as advertisements. And then some other network will signal them as placement opportunities. Because why not? Uh, so if you're writing any sort of code that has to deal with that uh, on your end, you're going to have to, it's going to have to be very robust and have to be able to, you know, accept a lot of different interpretations of Sky 35. Um, Sounds like Dash. It is a little bit like Dash. <laughs> designed by committee. <laughs> yeah, totally designed by committee. Um, one, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's being increasingly used to, uh, uh, for synchronization with EPGs. So there's a, a spec called Sky 224, also known as ESNI. And that's basically becoming like a live linear uh, schedule metadata and content rights specification. And the way it's written is that it allows you to actually express things in reference to the Sky35 markers that are in band. So it'll say something like, there's a program starting now, here's all the metadata for that program. But rather than give you an actual start time or, or end time, it says, look for this program start marker with this ID. And the program ends when you find the end marker with this ID. And so your system has to then kind of keep an eye out until these markers show up in the streams, uh, which comes with its own set of challenges as well. But what it does allow for is things like program extensions, where basically a game is running over time, or they don't know when it's going to end. And so they just kind of keep extending that program in the schedule or in the encoder. Um, any other questions I can answer about Sky35? Yeah, I got a, I, a couple. Of Kind of, then, okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, it, the comment you made just a minute ago about um, the recommendation from, I guess, probably from the Dash Industry Forum about mm -hmm. trying to make the ads kind of align with the periods and so on. Right. But is that, and, and, it's, and it's a little bit, it's really oversimplifies the reality. Is that a critique of the multi-period dash structure itself or just of the recommendation on how to do ad signaling? Um, I, I would say it's more the latter. I, I'm a, it's not really a criticism of the, of the um, MPD period uh, specification. It's more that 
Uh, they're they're assuming that things are linear in the Sky Theory Fire world, uh, world, and they're not, right? Yeah. They don't necessarily cleanly yeah. align. So, you know, I, a second question, if I can. Yeah. I, uh, what I'm noticing is, as a lot of these technologies are moving from the broadcast world to the web, there's a lot more trying to create uniformity, and that's what WAVE is about. We'll talk about that later. But um, uh, are people producing uh, encoders who are producing content uh, outside the broadcast space, uh, are they producing it with both, and they're producing HLS manifest with mm -hmm. the content, are they producing it with both of the markers, both the Apple preferred uh, XX ray, uh, date range as well as the, the SCUDI uh, yeah, some encoders are like so, like Ice Cream Planet's encoder does, for example. Um, we have like many custom schemes, probably. Right, yeah. Uh, and I think others have done similar things where uh, I think uh, Elemental, I think, even has some additional tags that were sort of early versions of that tag. So it can be problematic for sure if you don't necessarily know who's on the receiving end, how are you going to actually signal this? And thing? so that, that, that which, which relates to this whole issue of trying to create so many dependencies, the client has to be specific to the stream. Right. And, and of course, that's what you know. Standards are supposed to address, or at least industry for uh, profiles like the Dash industry for. I had a, another question about uh, earlier. You're talking about UPID, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and you listed all the, you know, the six. We have lots of standards. Yes, yeah. there's no problem. We got a lot of standards. <laughs> uh, the standard is that there's a lot. Of standards. I you know, it's, and there there was a lot of uh, IP battles and other issues around uh, ownership of those. Is that is that shaking out at all or people start uh, moving up the value chain and, and yeah i think i'm i think i'm seeing like a a, a lot of companies just now uh migrating towards either as as their standard as identifier the uh so i think it will shake out eventually uh but i mean generally what happens is that right the broadcaster or the network whoever the content owner is they're the ones that are essentially creating the sky through frame markers to reflect their own system, right? Yeah. And so if they internally use uh, you know, TMS IDs, then that's what they're gonna use in their Sky 35. And so that is one of the challenges of Sky 35 is that if you were to interpret it just on its own, with no basically uh, EPG or, or, or uh, program metadata to reference it against, it's kind of useless, right? Because it's giving you an ID for a program, but you know what that ID means. So you have to have something to actually go compare it against. Uh, and that is one of the challenges if you're basically, you know, building a universal player or something like that. Yeah. It's like you don't actually know what that database system yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and then generally, I think like one of the challenges with Sky 35 is that it really kind of is intended. I, I, I hear sometimes people talk about, you know, using Sky 35 markers on the player to do ad insertion. I think it's really difficult to do that because I think there needs to be a system basically interpreting a Sky 35 markers that sits upstream of the player that kind of simplifies it for the player because ultimately the player just needs to know here's here's a availability, right? Like here's a placement opportunity, go do your thing, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to know about all these other things. It doesn't necessarily need to know even about program boundaries or network boundaries or chapters, right? Mm -hmm. um, like that could all be communicated and simplified upstream of the player and communicated in a way that's, you know, easier to read, easier to understand that, you know, having this like binary payload. So so then the architecture, the preferred architecture for doing this uh, for linear delivery over the web has not been, it's not being, it hasn't been standardized. It's more a matter of we're, we're discussing it right now. Yeah, I would say so. It's, uh, I think, I think, yeah, it's, it's still a lot of custom workflows that are dealing with this stuff. 